Our third speaker, Robert Gray, is one of the most well-established and best-known poets in Australia. Um, he's one of my favourite Australian poets because he isn't what I think of as mainstream and he, does, he makes no attempt to be cool or famous. He just does the work, writes the poems. Um, he's published 12 books of poetry and he's won every major Australian poetry prize as well as the Patrick White Award, which is for in, you know, a writer in any genre. In 2008, he published a moving and evocative family memoir called The Land I Came Through Last, which has been highly praised by critics, and I think he's going to read us some of that, so please welcome Robert Gray. Thank you. I thought that before talking about my memoir, I'd give you a little sample of it, just read a little bit of it. Um, just a, a page or so. The, the book is mainly about my parents and about some other people who've, eccentric people who've been influential on me. Uh, the first chapter of the book is called Rumours of War. It's how my father came to be an exile. My father was a remittance man in, in his own country. In earlier times than his during colonial days, wealthy British families sent their unruly sons to Australia and maintained them on instalments so long as they stayed away. My father's family extended this tradition in the late 1920s within a continent that was still an outpost by forcing him to move 400 miles north of Sydney to an isolated place on the coast of New South Wales. They bought him a plantation there beyond a small town, up among the eucalyptus hillsides and above an empty sea, on condition that he not return to the city. And when he risked losing this property to further gambling and carousing, they set him up again, rather than have the embarrassment of him in the harbourside avenues of Vaucluse. It was apparently a torment for my father to be tethered outside Sydney, despite the perfect subtropical climate into which he had been sent. He knew the beauty of that place, Corora, but would have felt in the folded heat of one of, the, of its close valleys of an afternoon as if life had passed to another shore. Everything seemed embalmed in a bright, stagnant fluid where the occasional bubble broke loose and that was all. His mother, in telling me of the early days of her friendship, my mother, sorry, in telling me of the early days of her friendship with my father, whom she met on the coast, remembered how whenever he began to slip beyond her into drunkenness, he would mutter about the Metropole Hotel, which once stood at the centre of the city, and would name the mates he imagined lining the bar. All of them, she said, had easily lost contact with him. When he did break the family's edict and return to Sydney on two or three occasions while his father lived, it was never done unobtrusively enough. So my grandfather, a much tougher man than his son, although at times equally a drunkard, could at once have his will reinforced on my father through hired men without even needing to appear. Within a day or two of arriving in town, my father was debarred and brusquely treated in all the better drinking places. And then he was found, if not among the potted plant, palms and marble of the Metropole or of Adams Hotel, at a bar somewhere, perhaps down by the produce markets, with some immediate cronies. He would have looked like a puppet that for the moment was able to hold itself upright in its strings, as I have so often seen him, his face foolish with the effort of keeping its features in balance or he was found collapsed at a tram stop or in a park. Wherever it was, unknown hands hauled him to his feet, straightened him up, put a, pocket, put a ticket into his pocket, and with his kit bag forgotten about, loaded him onto the early evening train from Central, all without his understanding the extent of the conspiracy that was ranged against him. He woke in the morning to the guard's impatience, and was urged to step down onto a small platform, and he sat there on a bench until he came to himself, out among the wide-open paddocks in the immense light. My father was a very literate man despite his drinking, 
And lest you think that this book is a litany of uh, sad stories, it's actually um, much enlivened by his wit. What made me interested in writing about my father was uh, his verbal ability. When he was old and dying in a nursing home, I went to visit him and we sat out on the balcony in the evening and he looked around at the, at the, the dusk and the, the forested hillsides and the long stretch of the coast and he said, here we are, look, in this desert surrounded by an oasis. <laughs> and he had many uh, plays on language uh, similar to that. I once at the same time went to visit him in the nursing home and I'd been to the beach before going in and my sleeves were rolled up and my arms were sunburnt and my neck was sunburnt and he said when he saw me looking up, ah, I see you've been dealt some summary justice. <laughs> when I was a boy I heard that he'd been in the army in New Guinea and my mother whispered to me that he'd actually killed a man, a native, with a shovel, which sounds really horrible. And evidently this man, had, the native, had become drunk on my father's hidden supply of, of alcohol and uh, had pursued him with a, my father with an axe. And I asked my father if he'd been, what, what happened if he'd been chased by the native with an axe and he said, I think you should perhaps leave me a closet in my skeleton. And uh, another uh, uh, phrase of his that I remember was uh, um, he was very pleased with this pun which nobody caught and which I uh, only remembered later in writing the book. My mother was talking to a neighbour whose daughter was standing with her, a little girl, and my father came out with a hangover and stood beside them and uh, saw this child smiling and he said, ''Ah, oh, you have such fine precarious teeth.'' <laughs> her first tea. <laughs> but the book is full of these, uh, uh, this ability of his, which was of course a way of maintaining his self-respect. He thought that nobody understood his jokes, which pleased him, because it meant that he was superior to them, and the jokes that passed over their head only confirmed him in the fact that he wasn't merely an alcoholic, but uh, something much more, uh, someone who uh, uh, played with language. I wanted to address one issue that Karen raised, the issue of whether, this one I thought the best question, whether the memoir is a cop-out from stru the structural and imaginative demands of fiction. I was thinking about this and it occurred to me that fiction and the memoir have the same basis. They both depend upon vivid detail to make the story come alive whether it's a fictional or, a, or a, a, a report of real experience. Detail seems to me the secret of good writing. If one can come up with striking detail, everything is, is uh, transformed. And I was thinking uh, that um, this detail depends upon observation, so that really literature of any sort is dependent upon the writer's ability to observe, to respond, to be aware of life. No matter what writers might claim about themselves as being the unacknowledged legislators of the world, the antennae of the race, we know that they're not, that they're very fallible people. But one thing that all writers who are of any merit must have is the, the ability to observe. Uh, an instance came to mind. In Chekhov's uh, wonderful story, um, The Lady with the, with the Dog, or sometimes translated as The Lady with the Little Dog or The Pet Dog, there's an instance where Gurov has uh, just had sex with a young woman he's picked up at Yalta, and he's a hardened roué. And uh, this young, innocent woman in the hotel room after the... Uh, encounter between them, begins to weep and uh, lament that she's a ruined woman, he'll have no in further interest in her, uh, she's a, a, a terrible person, terrible person. And Gurov is, uh, Chekhov doesn't say he's bored by this, he says Gurov went to the table and cut himself a thick slice of watermelon from the watermelon that was lying there and sat and ate it slowly. 
and this detail says everything about his character and uh, uh, is uh, the most vivid possible way of describing the situation. There's another instance of a detail that's very telling that comes to mind. In War and Peace, um, uh, I think uh, Natasha is out with maybe Leviton. Um, I think it's Leviton. She's riding uh, with... Um, Natasha is a very rarefied delicate, beautiful creature. When I think of War and Peace, I always think of the film with Audrey Hepburn as Natasha, and that's my imagining of this character. But uh, Tolstoy said they, they go hunting, and they're riding on horseback through the brush and chasing an animal, and suddenly Natasha, in the excitement of the hunt, lets out a shriek like a wild animal. And it's quite shocking in the book, this, this rarefied young woman shrieking like a wild animal in the, in the bloodlust of the hunt. And so that's a detail that seems to me to really be immortal and to transfigure the, the, the book and lift it onto a really elevated level. In Chekhov's story, The Kiss, uh, an army battery is uh, camped uh, outside a village and uh, the local landowner sends an emissary to invite them to come for tea. And Chekhov starts the story with the man with the message coming on horseback, and he says, the soldiers at the battery were approached by a man on horseback. The horse was skittering sideways and prancing as if it were being lashed about the legs, and the rider had some trouble urging it over to where the officers were seated, sitting. And this is a very telling detail about the about this story because uh, the, the feet little horse, uh, like a toy horse, is contrasted with the, the soldiers in the battalion. And so immediately in the story there's set up this distinction on the part of the landowner and his, and his family who uh, very, have a very uh, cultivated way of life and the, and the military uh, uh, battery. I've just got one time for one more story about my father. This is one that I forgot um, and that I, I've only remembered recently. And so I rather hope you'll get the book so that it will sell out and then I can rewrite it and put, put in a couple of other stories that I've missed. My father sat to lunch and my, it was a hot summer day. My mother gave him a salad, cold meat, radish, tomatoes, cucumber, and he was hung over. The hangovers often lasted long into the morning. He was hungover and he uh, looked at this plate of salad and um, put his hands together. Steve, my mother was very religious, a uh, fundamentalist. He looked at what she'd served and put his fingers together and said, Let us pray? <laughs> so I hope to get the opportunity to put some more of his stories in. Our fourth speaker is Manju Kapoor. Uh, Manju lives in New Delhi. She's a novelist and a teacher of English literature. She hasn't actually written a memoir, but she has bravely volunteered to talk about it, and I'm looking forward both to the international perspective, the female perspective, and the fiction writer's perspective. Uh, Manju's novel, Difficult Daughters, won the Regional Commonwealth Literature Award for a first novel. Her most recent book is The Immigrant, which was published last year. Please welcome Manju Kapoor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, when I received this invitation to come here, I didn't actually look at the program. I was so excited about visiting Australia for the first time. Then, when I got Karen's questions two days ago, I was absolutely horrified. I said, memoir? And then I thought, uh, is there something the Writer's Week is telling me? Have they discovered my secret? Are they, you know, because I am a writer who is very careful to cover her tracks. Of course, I draw upon my life and the lives of people around me, but I always say I don't. That's the writer's standard thing. It's fiction. And you have this disclaimer in the beginning, all events and people are purely imaginary and any relationship to, you know, any actual person is coincidental. So when I knew I was going to be on a panel called Memoir, 
uh, first of all I said, I'm going to make my first novel into a memoir for the sake of, you know, being on the panel and, uh, you know, p preserving some kind of coherence. So this has to do, in fact, with how I became a writer, my first book, and uh, the journey that started with that. I was in my 40s when I decided to write only because I wanted to do something besides teaching and having children. By then I'd had four and writing was something I could do at home. So I, uh, I started with a novel of a woman like me, a teacher in her 40s, living in a in a DDA flat, that's a Delhi Development Authority, really lousy flats, you know, falling apart. So living in a DDA flat, divorced and all alone. So I drew upon my own life, wrote 80 pages, but this was clearly not getting anywhere. So I said, let me look at her mother's life. Perhaps that will, you know, why does she end up divorced and alone in the way she is? Perhaps her mother had something to do with it. And by the time I finished my mother's life, I had 170,000 words, 32 chapters, you know, clearly that was the novel. Um, I, I interviewed my mother, I interviewed her brothers and her sisters. I went back to trace a history that was hers, that was my own, that also had to do with the partition of our country. because. I come, I was born in a place called Amritsar, which is 30 uh, miles apart from Lahore. I don't know whether you know the geography of India and Pakistan, but these two cities were twin cities. Lahore was something that every Punjabi was really proud of. They shopped in Lahore, it was the cultural center, they studied in Lahore, they, you know, everything of any significance happened in Lahore. And after partition, when we lost Lahore, there was this great sense of loss in most Punjabi families. And this was a loss, in fact, that they didn't talk about. When I started interviewing my family for this novel, I came across all kinds of stories, really vivid, of refugee camps, of uh, kafla, kaflas, which were huge, long lines of refugees, Hindu refugees marching from Pakistan into India. And these were stories that nobody ever talked about. It wasn't that they were dim. They were absolutely vivid. And when I said, why don't you, you know, first of all, they thanked me. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about, to talk about things that we never talk about. And I said, why don't you do that? And they said, it's just too painful. Why bring up the past? you know, let's just go on. And these were people who had lost a lot. Uh, they'd lost families, they'd lost their homes, they'd lost everything they considered theirs. So this was a scar that's, you know, now 60 years old, 63 years old. I don't know when we are going to get our version of, you know, a Holocaust kind of literature or survival, survival stories. There is some but not that much. So while uncovering my mother's story, I was also uncovering you know, the partition of our country, the independence of it, and this was really exciting for me. And uh, I put in a lot of history uh, because I said, wow, every time I read you know, the archives and the newspapers, I said, wow, wow, you know. And uh, every time the book was rejected, I took a little bit of it out, you know. Clearly the wow factor was <laughs> impressing no one but me. So this was a book that was rejected eight times and by the last rejection, you know, it was half its size, no history or hardly any. But it's there in the inspiration to the book. And uh, my mother is also, you know, as I said, I did show this to her. I said, is this all right? You know, I am basing this somewhat on your life. Now my mother, uh, I mean, the, I guess the salient thing about her life at, was that she married a man who was already married. In 1942, this was perfectly legal. It wasn't until the Hindu Marriage Act of 1954 that men had to divorce their previous wife before they ma married again. And in fact, Hindu men could marry as much as they liked. I mean, they didn't, but they could. I mean, except if you were kings or gods, then you had about 100 wives. But, uh, so you could do this. And my mother, in marrying my father, 
you know, broke away from her family, from her tradition. Her family belonged to a Hindu reform movement. And for her to do this was to really put this back because uh, the Hindu reform movement was also, you know, not against, uh, against early marriage. My father's first marriage had been done when he was three. So, uh, so no early marriage, no child marriage, you know, education for women and so on and so forth. And then when my mother went and married a man who was already married, this was seen as a huge setback to the cause of female education because once women get educated, God knows what they'll do. And she was just, you know, showing all that, you know, uh, those fears that they came true. Um, this is her picture on the book. I did use her picture because I thought it was very appropriate to the story I was trying to tell. But in India, again, I deny. I didn't say she's not my mother, but when people said, oh, what a lovely picture, where did you get it? And I said, Faber chose it. And I didn't tell them that I had given the picture to Faber <laughs> because this is part of the covering of my tracks that I'm, I guess, pretty obsessed by. I mean, you're looking at a woman who writes her diary in the third person, so <laughs> that's pretty screwed up. <laughs> so, um, so for a woman who does that, writing fiction is the perfect cover. You know, it's not quite the truth, and yet in order to be able to write, you have to write about something that you're familiar with in order to give it authenticity. At least I have to have experienced it in some way, either personally or at one remove. And my books have been this kind of, the first one is the most autobiographical. Uh, I mean, I now say, because uh, the websites say it, you know, this is her most autobiographical book. Never mind that I'm denying this, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my books have been a kind of, uh, well, initially for me, an uneasy mixture between fact or what I've experienced, and a fictionalizing of it. And um, I write in the third person. Sorry, I have to get some water. <laughs> I write in the third person for this reason, because the first person just seems too immediate, too intimate, too close to you know, an I, an authorial I. And one day I feel, I want to do, I want to be able to do that, to write in the first person. You know, I can't yet. I mean, this book has about three pages of first person, and then I, you know, go off into the third person. So, uh, as I said, my books are this kind of, and particularly because I live in Delhi, I write about Delhi, I write about people I know in Delhi, and Delhi, for all its millions and millions of people, has a small, I mean, my own social circle is a small one, and everybody knows everybody, so there it is kind of literate, Western educated, uh, this kind of audience that I guess I'm writing for, does have uh, you know, they are connected to each other, and as I said, it can be, I mean, people come to Delhi and say, oh, Delhi is a village. I mean, you wouldn't think it to look at it, but that's what they say, that Delhi is a village. And I guess they mean its smallness, its parochialness, its uh, uh, insiderness. Uh, that's what they're talking about. So, uh, uh, as I said, my books are an attempt to negotiate the space between my own lives, the lives of people I know, and to put it in fictional form, which offends no one. I mean, in my first book, I wasn't so careful because I thought, if I'm not offending my mother, why does anybody else care? But all her brothers and sisters, and she's the eldest of 10, all of them cared, and all of them uh, you know, when I sent, because I'd interviewed them all, so I sent a copy to all of them. They read it and they hid it. They hid it from their children and their daughters-in-law because they thought it was such a bad example. I don't know what they thought, but, you know, clearly there was a great deal of disapproval in it. So, uh, and when I did ask, I said, I said, why? first of all, they said, we thought you as an academic were writing an academic book. 
And I said, oh, sorry. <laughs> and then they said, we thought, what is the use of, you know, we didn't think you'd present it quite like this. And the same argument they brought out, which they had uh, brought out about not talking about partition, it's past. What is the use of breaking it up? You have to go on and not look at the past. So, well, that's my family for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Robert Gray. Um, I wondered if your father knew of your intention to write the memoir, and, and then if so, you formally interviewed him, and uh, or just relied on your memories and and what he thought of that whole whole process. No, he didn't know that I was writing memoir. Uh, he once said to me, I hear you've written a book of poems. I think it's a good idea if I don't see it. <laughs> I've always wanted to write a book myself, and if I like what you've done, I'll be very jealous and give you a bad time. And if I don't like it, I'll give you a bad time. <laughs> so I didn't show him anything I've written. But I once asked my mother, I once said to my mother, I'm, when she was very old, I'm going to write about Dad... Uh, could I ask you some questions? And she said, uh, no need to ask me anything. Any lies you tell about your father, you'll be doing him a favour. <laughs> My question is to Manju. I'm in the process of reading The, the White Tiger about Delhi's underbelly. Are you, have you any intention of going there? No, not if you know Delhi's underbelly, you don't want to go there. <laughs> so, um, no. In uh, fact, in Delhi, um, I lead a somewhat protected life. I, you know, I, I don't use public transport. We, it's an it's a upper-middle-class life, you know, when I have people to do things for me. I, if I have to go anywhere, I have a car, I have a driver. In fact... Uh, what does take me out of my, uh, uh, my comfort zone is my books. Uh, writing about them, researching, researching them, going to places that I'm going to use, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, medical research has indicated that every time you call a memory, you recreate it. My wife, who was a writer, started a novel that she didn't finish before she died by saying... Uh, by an act of imagination, we create something and call it memory. How does that work in regards to what you consider and what everybody else considers a memoir? Well, we could talk a long time about how memory works and the history of memory. You know, the history of mnemonics, for example, the way buildings have been and mosaics have been created as mnemonic devices. There is a mysterious thing about the way that the neurology of memory is quite mysterious, but there's a common thread which is that memory needs to be externalised. So it's one of those things that you can only possess for yourself by actually putting it out there. So that's why people have photos and rings and all, all kinds of things. I mean, a wedding ring is a mnemonic device of a sort. And... Um, but I suppose my angle was sleep, and I wrote this comedy about sleep, but the frontier of sleep research is fetal sleep, and particularly the question, why do uh, fetuses have so much REM sleep, which is a particular phase of sleep, but most of us have a limited amount of it, but babies in the womb have almost entirely REM sleep. And the theories are that this is uh, closely cre created with working the synapses and particularly the synapses that create language and memory. So there is a, um, there's a, there's a close relationship between the ability to rest and the ability to remember. And I think imaginative writing is a contemplative state. That it is somebody who is not only observing the detail but still enough to take it in. That's the kind of link, I think. As a playwright who's had the privilege twice of fulfilling the role of interlocutor for um, 
transcribing um, and giving shape to the memories of, of two people. One, um, a Nigerian um, from eastern Nigeria who was a child soldier in the Biafran War, and I created, helped him to create a memoir. And another, a Gazan Palestinian who was trapped in Gaza during the invasion last year. It seems to me that the function of interlocutor as well as fidelity to the memories and the experiences of one's subject is also somehow to discern shape or structure in what one is being told. And yet the temptation is to impose an arbitrary structure or, 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 or to... Uh, it seems to me to become too subjective in, in, in you know, the, how the story hits one's own sensibilities um, and, uh, and take it off somewhere completely different. And, and I wonder whether any of the panel have any thoughts about that process of, of the transcribing of memory and, 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 the, and the discernment of structure or the arc of the story or whatever as it, as it comes to you. Think of the public memory, the public record memory of society, the media of which I've worked in for 20 years. Um, there is, every day, you go into someone's life whom you don't know, and you then write something about them as if you are an authority on their life. It's a complete fraud. But it happens every day in every newspaper and television, and um, you uh, are using so many sleights of hand, moral sleights of hand, to uh, assume that authority and you make terrible mistakes in facts you get things wrong and you're arrogant in assuming things about someone and um, uh, and therefore it is an entirely subjective fraught and difficult thing and in some ways when you go from that to memoir writing memoir you see that there's a bit of a moral inversion at work and that people tend to criticise memoirists for meddling in people's intimate lives and, and you know, having a subject, objective, putting a subjective record about a, a, a family or a, a series of events. But when I come at it from the, you know, from, from the media's point of view, having worked in the media, nobody ever says, nobody ever criticises you for putting a foot in the door of someone's life. They actually say you're acting in the public interest. So um, I feel uh, very free in doing what I do, whether I'm subjective in doing it or not, as a memoirist. I don't really care, because I feel as though um, it's the other mob that uh, the critics should be attacking. <laughs> Thank you.